I confess to a
There is none like thee, O Lord. Thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O King of the nations? For this is thy due. For among all the wise ones of the nations, and in all their kingdoms, there is none like thee. What should we have been doing in Advent? As ever, it's easy to find an answer in the liturgy. In the collect for the first Sunday, we beseech Almighty God for the resolve to run forth to meet Christ at his coming. As the season nears its climax, we express in the O antiphons the conviction that there is no better way to run to our divine Saviour than to give voice to our desire and to directly, ardently, and insistently petition him to come to us. Advent is thus a time to exercise our desire. According to our Holy Father Augustine, the whole life of a Christian is holy desire. That brings us to today's antiphon. O King of the nations and their desired one, the cornerstone making both one. Come and save mankind, whom you fashioned from the mud. We began on Thursday with the universal hunger of the mind for wisdom, a hunger satiated by no one but Christ, the wisdom of God. From here, we followed the people of Israel in allowing our desire to be focused into a more particular yearning for a Messiah who will spring from the root of Jesse and will be the king and will be the key of David. Today, our petition opens out again in recognition of one too great to be constrained by purely tribal language. He is also the desired of the Gentiles, of all the nations. What does it mean to speak of Christ as desired even by non-Jews? One perspective is that this is a latent desire that has begun to be fulfilled with the proclamation of the gospel to the ends of the earth. This latent desire implies a kind of divine magnetism permeating all creation. Our blessed Lord, after he identified himself as the bread of life, declared, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. On what does this magnetism act? Let's return to the antiphon. In this sixth antiphon, we find an echo of the sixth day of creation. We call upon the Saviour to save mankind fashioned from mud, fashioned in the image of God. Despite the disfigurement of sin, we still find that image in our rational nature, to which belongs that noble faculty we call the will our rational appetite for the good. By it, we aren't merely able to draw near God, the good itself, but we are able to love him, and indeed to be united to him in love. Every human heart, then, is able to be touched by the divine love, and it is through our heart's desire that God wills that all be saved, even those yet to gain explicit knowledge of their Redeemer. The Magi have already set off on their long and difficult journey. Their profound love for the transcendent, cultivated through a life contemplating the truth and beauty of the heavens, has enabled the Creator to summon them by a star 
towards his chosen people. Soon, by their guidance, he will bring them prostrate before our incarnate Lord. Like the Magi, we must also be schooled by the messianic prophecies of Israel. The word of God transmitted by the great prophets and born of a genuinely effective longing can once again be deployed by us to affect something. I say their longing was effective because we can, in a certain technical sense, say that it merited the incarnation. I, of course, don't mean that their actions made God our debtor in any sense, but rather it was fitting for God to send his son to take flesh in response to the cooperation of their hope. How extraordinary that God should allow human hope to cooperate, to be cooperational with his redemptive work. In fact, we can even say with the blessed apostle, by hope we were saved, because our own hope for salvation is a manifestation of saving grace. Formed by the same scriptures though it may be, we don't possess our common hope as a shared, bare fact. Our Lord comes to us by grace in precisely the measure that we are able to receive him. We need not despair of our cold, atrophied hearts that love and hope so feebly. Even an embryonic desire for Christ is enough. The unborn Baptist shows us that. True desire expands the soul and will soon make the heart leap for joy. Desire that enlarges the soul, that makes us truly magnanimous, is attention and not our own unilateral action. We love because he loved us first. On the cross, the Lord Jesus loved his own to the end and so brought upon himself an overwhelming thirst for our love that we might be caught up in that breath of love between father and son, which is the love of the blessed Trinity. It is an unquenched thirst for our God wills that all be saved. But happily, desire grows as long as it is unfulfilled. Fleeing the hound of heaven only hastens his pursuit. And so it, go, it goes too for our desire. We must also allow those moments when the Lord seems most absent to intensify our desire for him so that he will find our hearts wide open when he returns. Only then will we be prepared to accept the consolation of his abiding presence in our souls and to know the breadth and the depth of the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Let us pray with David. Lord, all my desire is before thee. O gates of my heart, lift up your heads. Let him enter the King of glory.
Let us pray. In your mercy, Lord, dispel the darkness of this night. Let your household so sleep in peace that at the dawn of a new day they may with joy waken in your name. Through Christ our Lord. May the almighty and merciful Lord grant us a quiet night and a perfect end. Amen. Fidelium animae per misericordiam Dei, requiescant in pace.